You might draw my attention to the fact that it's there and then be like, if you're interested in this, you know, you're welcome to it. But I don't think, I don't think, yeah, we don't. It's like, look what I've got. <laughs> Hey, hey, I'm Jess O'Reilly, your friendly neighborhood sexologist, and my job is to help you hopefully feel more confident about yourself so you can have more fulfilling relationships and, of course, much hotter sex. Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm Jason, and we're the Sexy Hippies. We're a camming couple. We also make video clips, and uh, yeah, we share our lives online. So good to see you both. How you doing? Doing great, thanks. Doing How great. are you? Thanks for having us. Today, we are talking about how to make consent sexy. Now, of course, Consent is mandatory and it doesn't have to be sexy, but for a lot of people we want to make consent playful and exciting and it's really, consent is really about opting into an experience. It's not just no means no, it's about wanting to do what you're doing and we, we're, we're going to talk about this, but consent is something you give freely without coercion. You can always revoke consent at any moment in time, but let's, let's chat about it. Let me ask you just off the bat, what does consent mean to you? I, I mean, you took all the words right out of my mouth that I would have said. <laughs> what does consent mean to me? Just uh, two, con two adults that are agreeing to participate in whatever way they each feel comfortable with each other to... Hang on, only two? Oh, excuse me. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think, I, 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 no, definitely not only two. Like, I think that might be like the, the first layer is like oh, right. consent with one other person. But uh, you sure, if you can manage multiples, go for it. I think there's consent that you can give to be participating in group activities or that an instructor would give for you to participate in, you know, things like that. So I feel like, yeah, I think it just is about uh, agreeing enthusiastically to an activity with humans or a human or humans <laughs> <laughs> i love it i was just kidding i mean i guess it's a two person minimum but i've, I've seen some videos right. uh, and i've been to some parties <laughs> <laughs> and i know you have too and we can talk about that let me ask you between the two of you in a long-term relationship how do you make sure that you're cultivating consent in an ongoing way because that's really different than perhaps someone who's on a first date and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment sure yeah absolutely do you want to um, yeah, sure. Okay. I think that for us, you know, we're, we're having to constantly have that conversation and you would think maybe as partners and spouses that that wouldn't be the case, but uh, people's likes and dislikes change over time as well as also like people's health is, in, you know, involved in how they're feeling about doing any activity. So um, we try to be really kind of like just start from zero as often as possible and just ask and make sure things are cool. Um, with sex and with other things. I think consent's important for a lot of things, just any kind of touch. Sure. You know. I can Absolutely. totally agree with that. I think for, for, as an example, for me personally, um, there are times when I'm okay with her coming up behind me and giving me a pat on the butt or a spanking or something, but there are other times when I'm not. So it's not a given that she's okay to just walk by me and slap me on the ass. I'm, I'm not always open for that. But yeah. But there are times when I might say, hey, like, I've been feeling really comfortable with that. If, if, uh, if you're feeling open to something like that, go for it until I say otherwise. You know? I love that. You've touched on some really important points. So first and foremost, you're using verbal cues. You're actually just asking people. And that's oftentimes the most clear way. You've also touched on the fact that your desires change over time. So when you give consent freely, it doesn't mean that it's carte blanche for the rest of your life. And people can right. get confused about that. They might say, well, you were into it last time. When we think about, you know, right. more um, risque activities or activities that maybe you don't do on the regular, maybe it's about like finishing in a certain place or a specific sex act, you might be cool with it on a Tuesday and on Saturday, you're just not feeling it. Or you might be really comfortable right. with it six months into the relationship, but maybe postpartum you're not. Like all of these things, change yeah, right. so so there's the verbal uh let's talk about the sexy side of the verbal so you're not you know you're not robots like me or may i please touch your your butt like <laughs> i imagine or maybe you are and if you're into that that's cool too but how do you do it in a sexy way like jason how do you let melissa know uh yeah i'm in the mood for this today oh good question <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I, I am a verbal person. Uh, that, that's what makes me feel safe. So in terms of I'm, I, 
can you give me an example of maybe I'm just not thinking of ways I might actually be communicating non-verbally, but oh, I'm, um, I'm even what thinking verbally. What is an example of a non-verbal communication that, um, yeah, that might be relevant? So I'm thinking verbally. What do you say? Do you say like "come over here" or "I want more of that" or "I love when you do that"? I'm just thinking about how you you communicate verbally in a way that also feels fun and playful. Yes, um, you know, even something like a. Hmm. I can answer that. Okay, 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 please. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, I, I asked you nice. about this specific question before we started, and I was like, ah, I think, I hope something flows, but maybe you can help me here. <laughs> okay, so when he wants to have sex, I know because, well, first he approaches me <laughs> in a different way than normal. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's okay. No, he approaches differently. Like, he walks up, like, a little slower or softer or a little bit more something, and I'm like, oh, I know. I know what's coming. And he's always like, hey, babe. Like, is it okay if I stick my mm in your mm? And I'm like, for like, or something to that extent. Is it okay if I, if you with my, you know, do this with my that? And, um, and yeah, and then, but it's like really cute and soft. And I'm like, yeah, usually. <laughs> yeah. I love that. That's how he's going to do it because he like approaches softly. <laughs> he's getting soft right now. I'm getting worried. <laughs> he's getting a little quiet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it's very, it's very cute. It's very kind of like non non pressury and um yeah but he he definitely always asks and and always um yeah is like really soft about it so that's my experience. i i love that and i love that you provided some language because sometimes it's as simple as hey babe can i do this or can i put my blank in your blank or are you in the mood <laughs> for now i know right, many people exactly. haven't been <laughs> I know you haven't been perhaps spending as much time apart as of late, but when you're apart, do you also cultivate consent from a distance? Like, are you texting one another about what you might want to do when you get home? Yes. Um, not as often because we really do spend a, a lot of time <laughs> with each other. Um, but yeah, we've, we've been known to, 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 to sext a little bit, I suppose. Um, yeah, not much because we really like are together 98% of the time. So it's like a quick run to the grocery store or someone's dealing with the baby while the other person's doing something real quick. And then we try to do even a lot of family activities. So most of our stuff is, uh, you know, I guess in person. <laughs> That's fair enough. I think that a lot of people are using sexting now and sexting can be words, it can be yeah. audio messages, it can be videos, it can be pictures. I think everybody thinks that, you know, it's a dick pic, but there's so much more, so much, so many more layers and nuance to, to sexting for sure. So sure. tell me- The emoji can be, can be some sort of innuendo, you know? Yeah, for me it's we the pumpkin. We did more sexting at the beginning when we didn't live together or like when I went on a trip, at one, I went like out of the country for like a whole month when we first started. Dating, and that was actually my very first time having like, um, what is it called? Video, you know, video conferencing sex or whatever. Called, <laughs> Skype, so I don't even know what program we use, but that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, so we did it at the beginning, but I think just now we, we're, we're always together, so. <laughs> okay, give us some, some ideas then. So Melissa, if Jason were to text you in a way to be playful or flirtatious, that also would help to cultivate consent, what kind of text would you want to receive? Well, it's funny, now that you're saying something like that, I'm like, well, hold on, because he has his own OnlyFans, and so do I, and sometimes he doesn't, he'll shoot content and not tell me, and then he'll post it, and I see it via the feed, so I kind of feel like that's sort of like a, um, you know, like a dick pic or something like that, but I think that that would probably be what I would want, is like a, a sexy picture of him to start off with, and then, you know, something like, uh, thinking of you, you know, or something like that, and then a, a sexy picture. And then I could kind of be like, whoa, okay, hey, you know, and then maybe send one as well. And so I think we, we both like photography. So I'm like way more inspired by a photo that he took and then took time to edit. And then he sends, you know, rather than just like a quick snap. So because I think the attention to detail and the artistic stuff is also really sexy. So I guess we might end up sending each other not photos in the moment, but photos that we already edited. <laughs> effort, effort is sexy sometimes. Like, show yeah. some effort. If yeah. you're gonna be flicking up. Right? If you're going to send a sex to, like, clean up the room in the background, adjust the lighting. Yeah, man. I think it matters. Oh, wow. Look, exactly. Look, you cleaned up the room. I wonder what that means. Put, put right. a vignette on it, you know, like black that we focus on the right spot, you know? I don't know. I just think it's sexy when the colors look good, I guess. 
I like that. So it sounds to me, so you've touched on verbal cultivation of consent. You've also talked about the visual. Um, what about the physical? How can you cultivate consent physically? Like, for example, Jason, you were saying like about the smacking of the butt. Do you ever take her hand and put it, put it on your butt to let her know that you're actually in the mood and feeling good about it? What's the physical side uh, of consent for you? I do. I, I have done that, and I, I do think that's appropriate. That definitely speaks to me. There's one element about that scenario where I'm like, ooh, we missed an opportunity for consent there, which is me putting my hand on her, unless I have blanket permission already to like, or maybe we were already touching each other, I'm probably going to ask for consent to grab her arm and then and then be suggestive about that, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't think you would grab my hand and put it on your hard, you know, things. I think you would some, because it's it's a little, yeah, it's a little bit, if, I don't know, a few steps further, there'd be some other, like, you might draw my attention to the fact that it's there, and then be like, if you're interested in this, you know, you're welcome to it. But I don't think, I don't think yeah, we don't. It's like, look uh, what I've we're got. Like, we're like real gentle about it, you know? Yeah. Maybe a little bit more than most maybe married couples. I don't, I don't know. I'm not trying to compare. Yeah. But yeah, we're real careful about it. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask why that is? Because I do think there's a spectrum. So I'll give you an example. So I've been with my partner forever and definitely he wouldn't ask me, hey, is it okay if I touch your butt? I would always be comfortable with him touching my butt. And that's something that I've already verbally communicated. Uh, I've also verbally communicated to him, for example, if I'm sleeping, you have consent to wake me up in all of these sexy ways. Uh, and if I'm half asleep, I'm okay too. That's not something he guessed at. That's something that we have verbally, I won't say negotiated. I've just delineated that, you know, that's cool with me and so uh, you know there's this there's this spectrum there's no right there's no wrong there's what's right for you and it sounds like you figured out what's right for you um, is there was there a learning curve or is there a reason that you're a little bit more careful about this we we have that exact same scenario she has given me lots of open permission to wake her up and in, in these different varieties of ways and to proceed with lots of different activities and um uh, it has been very difficult for me to really embrace that because mm -hmm. i feel like maybe i'm not as open to that as much as maybe she is um i really enjoy sleeping and staying asleep i i often like i, I wouldn't say i have trouble sleeping but once i'm down and i'm ready to go to sleep i really mm -hmm. don't enjoy waking up until like i've gotten a lot of rest but she's different she's fine with waking up and having some sexy time if uh, if the mood strikes me i suppose and so um i have seen uh two people uh you're probably familiar with king ja uh king noir and jasmine they were we were in a class that they were teaching one time and they were on stage doing a demonstration and king was going to touch Jasmine as a part of the demonstration. And clearly they know what they're doing. They've done this before. They're married. They spend a lot of time together. They're in a very similar space as we are here. And he asked for permission to touch her arm. And that landed so heavy with me. I've never forgot it. Aww. And that meant a lot to me to say, wow, look, like here are people that I look up to that are parents that are doing similar work, that have a lot of integrity and they still choose to participate that way and i get that that's for their relationship but i think that really spoke to me so that's like my baseline it's like like just ask for permission unless you really already know that the door is wide open yeah and i think that's especially important when you're practicing kink like i know king and jasmine were probably demonstrating something kinky on stage and that's very you know intrinsic to kink practices and bdsm so. community <laughs> it ought so. to be. It, was it a ought parenting to be. Class. It was a porn and parenting class, so oh, it, was like, okay. it wasn't necessarily related to kink, but they were in some way, shape, or form describing something that required a little touch and consent. So I love I it. Yeah, I think with, I think it's also important to say that uh, there has been trauma with both of us physically okay. in the past, and so whether it's sexual or just regular physical, and so I think that part of the consent is is just really checking in and making sure because you know that you're always like working through that and you know if you go to therapy or whatever it's like something that I think yeah I think that you might not be aware of where you're like checking out in sex because maybe you've had some sexual trauma in the past and so I think there's times when I give consent blanketly 
but he would prefer that I be checked in during the experience, so he's mm-hmm. gonna like double check because it's like, yeah, yeah, sure, you've said it's okay, but like you've also you are also still trying to work through some of these trauma responses and and unconscious behavior that you're trying to change and things like that. So right. I think there's like part of that is like the self work that we're doing as well is just like why not go one step like more careful and just ask because yeah. Well, to add to that, I, I've had moments, we've had moments where there was definitely blatant consent given and then mid act um, it felt to me like like something changed and mm-hmm. that maybe she was now not able to give or, or not able to revoke, revoke yeah, the consent exactly. and that maybe things maybe like when somebody goes into subspace for instance they can't always advocate for themselves and sometimes it takes the person that they're engaging with to be mindful of like hey I think Maybe I'm not getting the feedback that uh, we that that we were having for a little while there, and now I need to check in again. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're bringing up some very important points. Um, that is number one is that you want to be constantly cultivating consent, uh, and as I said, consent doesn't have to be sexy, but it is sexy to check in on your partner and see how yeah. they're feeling. Um, so that's a really important piece. And trauma histories are also very, very important. And that really is a, a reminder that there is no singular way to cultivate or give consent. And yeah. not everybody has the same capacity or privilege to speak up in all circumstances, which is it's right. really yeah. cool that you're saying, you know, I noticed something shift. And that's why, yes, we've got we've got our words. Can I do this? Yes, I want you to do that. Uh, but we also can have to pay attention to people's body language, right? If they're saying Absolutely. yes, but they're kind of pulling away and that's not a pre-negotiated yeah. dynamic that you've discussed, because uh, that can be right in some kinky ways, right. but it isn't, yeah. then it might be time to check in and be like, is this still feeling good? Or even ask if they'd like to take a break or better yet, if you're getting the vibe that isn't, that something isn't working for someone, you ask to take a break. Like you can always kind of model the behavior for them. Uh, and I think that can be very permission giving when they see other people doing it as well. Right. And then that ends up creating a really deep level of intimacy and trust, which in turn is sexy, you know, at least for me. <laughs> Same. So it might seem like it's all uh, maybe tiptoeing around some things or it might be like too heavy, but or it's um, ruining the moment. Yeah, ruining the moment or yeah, something. But I think it's like really important because if you keep addressing things, then you can keep your partner. Everybody's checked in the whole time. And then you're really having these amazing sexual experiences because you've, you know, I think a lot of times we're all used to doing stuff that we don't want to do because someone made us do it. And whether that's sex or something else, it's just important to keep in mind that you might be saying yes or you might be not saying no because you just can't get the words out. And and so it's important to just go slow. You know, you know uh, there's so much to talk about here. You're really making me think about the fact that we talk about consent when it comes to sex. And it's, it's a topic that comes up a lot more now. But it's not always mirrored in other areas of our lives. We've still normalized non-consent or consent violation culture in other realms, whether it be business or friendships or the way we negotiate. There is so much that's rooted in bullying and manipulation uh, and trying to pressure people. And so when we normalize that behavior outside the bedroom, we can't move from a place of love and consent. Uh, And so, I mean, this is a big question, but how do we reconcile those two, right? If you're so used to being told, no, you need to pressure them to get what you want in business negotiations, how do we, first of all, we can break that down in business and still have fruitful results. That's another conversation. But how do we break those bad habits to ensure that we're not doing the same in the bedroom? And is that one of the reasons why you are um, so careful and clearly verbal Mm. in the way you cultivate consent with one another? That's a really good point, and you just made me think of, like, all the times that... So if I'm on my phone, like, reading something, he'll say, are you available for me to tell you something? And I try and do the same. No, we're not we're not the best at this, always, because, you know, sometimes you're just, like, blurred out stuff. But yeah. <laughs> we ask for consent to speak. We ask for consent to, like, hand something to somebody. We don't just, like, take, take it, take it. We don't do that. So you're right. Like, we're trying to work on it in a lot of different areas. That's really cool. Yeah, that check-in, like, is this a good time for you? I think about emotional consent and emotional consent violations like you know working in my field sometimes people yeah. unload on me like I'm just going to the coffee shop and they're they're like oh I'm glad you're here I need to tell you about this breakup and I'm thinking I got five minutes between meetings and I've just you know dealt with other stuff in my family I don't really t- want to take on somebody's yeah. um, right. emotional baggage but 
I feel pressure uh, and I definitely struggle with people pleasing. And so I do things I don't want to do all the time. Listen, like, I mean, I don't do things sexually that I don't want to do for some reason, probably because it's my job and that's my area of study. I feel very <laughs> firm in my boundaries. But in other parts of my life, I really struggle with that people pleasing. I don't, are either of you people pleasers? Working on not being. I definitely did a lot of what you're saying, but now, like, I won't, I will just stop. I do not consent to hear this information right now. I'm not emotionally available for this right now. Um, it's it's kind of made our world a little smaller, to be honest. Like, you, you definitely lose some friends and mm -hmm. lose some people wanting to deal with you because I just, like, it's like, nope, there's my boundary right there. So um, I'm working on it, and I'm working on trying to maybe find other people who are down with that because the, the people who are not down with that will get out of your life real quick when you start doing that. So. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's such an important piece, right? Around saying like, I don't have the bandwidth for that. And even yeah, just hearing you say, sure. yeah, hearing you say your words though is really like helpful for me because people are stuck on the words, whether it's the words for sexting or the words to set a boundary with someone they care about or someone they don't care about. Uh, we just, we need the language and we need to practice it. And as a sex educator, you know, coming from like school-based education, one of the things I always tried to communicate to parents and to students was that we're building foundational skills here. Like sex ed isn't even about mm. sex. It's about the capacity to say, that feels good, that doesn't feel good. I don't know how I feel about that. Let's explore more, right? And so whether that's about mm. playing with a friend um, or you know, getting into a sexual situation when you're, aware, when you're an adult, those skills become transferable. So um, I, I think it's like, I'm, you know, reflecting on myself, I need to work on them outside of the bedroom. I need to take the tools that I have in the bedroom and apply them uh -huh. outside the bedroom. And for most people, it's the opposite, right? They tend to be better at communicating outside the bedroom and then forget about those communication skills inside the bedroom. Now, um, as professionals, as performers, I'm curious, how do you ensure that you cultivate consent before a shoot, before a scene? Mm. Yeah, I'll let you answer, but I just wanted to say, I think we also had the same trajectory of learning how to do it here in the shoot and then expanding it out and going, wait a minute, we can consent all over the place and like, we don't have to, you know, and then you can be really nice. I just want to say one thing about the coffee shop, you know, you can be like, I hear you. I'm so sorry that you're struggling right now. I, uh, I, you know, I have availability at this other time. I do not have any right now. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to stop you from from talking, but we can re we can revisit this. You know, I feel like you can be super polite and just but be like kind of firm in the boundary. And then change coffee shops and never go back there. <laughs> I, know. I know. I do that too. Okay. That's really that's actually that's really useful language for me. Thank you. Yeah. So so yeah. What what do you what do you consent with doing shoots? Yeah. What do you know. You? Mm -hmm. All the same rules, rules that we've been talking about, we just carry over into us doing our own home shoots. But things definitely get interesting because we do play with others and we do create content with others sometimes. So um, working out those details with others is, um, is a different challenge. You know, everybody else has different uh, boundaries in their own dynamics with their partners and then trying to get say three or four people or more together to do uh, to create a space where nobody's boundaries are being crossed gets um, gets gets interesting and, and um, oftentimes there are things that we maybe didn't talk about before we went into the shoot that are now coming up especially when you're yeah. live streaming and you've got you know, a couple thousand people in your room that are all throwing out ideas and they're throwing money at you to do right. things. Um, it, it can change the dynamic and kind of make you think, wait, am I really comfortable with this? Or am I just doing it for the money? Am I actually not okay, but I really want the money? You know, it's not all about money, but it's a strong dynamic. It's a strong element. Um, so we, we try to take these same skills. We try to create a little bubble to be in with the other the other uh, the other people and uh, do whatever we can to sort of stay inside of those rules and then if we need to talk about something we stop and we talk about it in the moment and try to keep things fluid and um, address things that come up and just remind everyone like you can always nope out you know you can always revoke consent and um, again, back to where we were earlier, like check in if something doesn't feel right, if somebody's mm -hmm. not giving you the vibe that you are comfortable with, then maybe I need to step back and say, I'm not comfortable right now. Yeah. And, and, and specifically speaking, we have specific meetings about different elements of the consent. So usually it first starts with like, 
uh, where if they're going to stay at our house or not. Are they renting a car? You know, all those like stay at your house consent things. There you things. go. How, how intertwined <laughs> yeah. are we and all? Then, like, lying like, on each other. Yeah. Pretty, sorry. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, um, but yeah, like, like, yeah, staying accommodations, what are your needs? Uh, STI testing, what is everybody's needs? Because, side note, everybody, not every panel tests for all the things, so you need to make sure you know which um, illnesses you're looking for and, you know, ask. So we have to have that whole consent of, like, are you okay with all of these different tests? And then we have to have a consent of how the show is going to go, how the sex is going to go, how the content is going to be distributed later, how we're going to price it later, because we have to agree on all these things. And then hopefully we're still friends in the end, which I think is the case with everybody we've worked with. But like it takes a lot of time. It's many, many days of planning. Right. So. And, I, and I do think that that's a struggle for us sometimes because we're feeling like we are like our our expectations of consent are often higher than others. And other people think I get the vibe sometimes that we're a little bit more uptight about those about those <laughs> rules than others and that they're just like, come on, let's just, you know, do this and we'll be fine. And I'm like, no, that, that we won't. We, we might not be. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> so, yeah, it can be difficult. You, you know, there's so much interesting stuff here. I want to talk a little bit about gender because oftentimes I think in the hetero context, it's framed as men asking women for permission to protect themselves in terms of not getting in trouble around consent violations instead of people of all genders checking in with one another to make sure that it feels good. Let's be honest, so many of us are having sex for pleasure, right? And it may not be, it can be erotic pleasure, it can be relational pleasure, it can be emotional pleasure, spiritual pleasure, financial pleasure, whatever your motivation, motivation for having sex, there's usually pleasure involved. So is that something you you talk about about what's pleasurable for you and i am curious if um the gender dynamics come into play I, like i i hear from men especially cis straight men who are uncomfortable setting their boundaries because they feel pressure to be into everything all the time and be raring to go like animals i would say that uh when we've worked with men, men and women cis men and cis women the women are usually the first to explain their boundaries and they're very like open about it. They're like, here's what I do, here's what I don't do, list, list, list. And then we'll be like, and you, you know, to the, to the male. <laughs> and he's kind of like, oh, oh me? You know? <laughs> and so it's, it's uh, they do seem to be like, not asked that as often. And I have to pry a little bit and, and say, you know, like, is it okay if I touch your testicles in this way? Is there a certain way that you need to be touched in order to ejaculate, things like that. Um, so is there a temp a lot of people don't think about the temperature like is there a temperature in the room that's going to make it or make or break the deal for you so like sometimes you just maybe have to ask different questions because you know a lot of times like they might be okay putting their penis somewhere but they also aren't um okay with like touch on their arm or something like that so you gotta you gotta like really get in there sometimes and ask some questions uh, I would love to hear some more of those questions that you ask. I just, I think that like the specificity of like, can I lick your testicle in this way? Do you want me to cup your balls in this way? Um, are you more sensitive as you get aroused or less sensitive? Can I touch you right yeah. here? Should I use two fingers? Should I use a toy? Should I use my, my knuckles? Like, I want to hear all those questions because I think we all need to hear them. I think there's a lot of information out there that's like, communicate, talk, make sure you, you know, you're clear about your boundaries. But I think we need the specificity that you're offering. I appreciate that a lot. Okay, sure. If you have any, throw them out, but I've got, uh, I like to check on first, like the environment of the room, like fabrics, fabrics, uh, lights and temperature, as well as music, if they need music or not. Some people really need music to do things. Um, of course, we check angles. Are there any angles that you feel uncomfortable being filmed at? But that's just like for our particular business. It's great. Um, we ask, I, I try to make sure with cis men that I'm asking like all the questions, like I said, about uh, the sensitivity of their genitals and where they do, do and don't like to be touched at certain points in the arousal, because I think that is very different from person to person and mm -hmm. usually is a big factor of whether or not they're going to actually enjoy it. Um, we, is everybody rested? Have they yeah. eaten food beforehand? Mm -hmm. Is there enough water and coffee on hand or whatever anybody's needing? You know, I try to build that little nest so everyone feels mm -hmm. safe and has their needs met. It's uh, Usually we work with couples, so we always ask all of their boundaries. You know, is there a no kissing rule or is there a um, he only ejaculates with his partner rule or she only 
does this, you know, like a lot, everybody's kind of got some unique things. Um, and sometimes there's like even like ritualistic things where they want to like guide his penis into his, you know, her yeah. safely for the first time and, and right. inter interesting things like that. So we'll see if there's any almost practically rituals that people like to do if they're swapping, for example, so that they feel really comfortable. Um, you know, like maybe, do you want us to avoid eye contact and you guys look at each other? Or what, what do we need to do here? You know, so um, I think that's a good one to just be open to it. Like we don't have a lot of no's for us when we swap, but other people might. And so we just, that's cool. That's cool. If you guys have a no kissing rule, we don't, but we obviously won't do the kissing thing. Right. And so we just got to like, sometimes I don't know all the ones to ask. You know, sometimes people bring something up and I'm like, oh wow, that's a right. new one. Like I didn't right. even. Oh, I have one that I can speak on. Yeah. I, I discovered that somebody that I was having sex with mid mid live stream, lots of people creating, uh, people had paid to get into like a private show and my penis got poked by an IUD and it was pretty painful and I was not aware that it was even there. I didn't get a fair warning yeah. and I did not know that that was possible and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got a, um, a urinary tract infection from that. <laughs> And that was miserable for me, and now I know to ask. <laughs> now I know how to, you know, make sure that we're all on the same page about that. So contingencies that you couldn't imagine until it happens to you. It's, I mean, you're talking right. about environmental and physical comfort. You're talking about physical pleasure and the body. You're talking about safer sex practices. Um, some of them are more business related for you, but it sounds like all these questions apply across the board. I imagine there's also conversations sure. around language to use, right? Like how do you like me to refer to your body, to your person, to your name, to your genitals? Are there words that are, you know, red, green, or yellow? meaning I don't right. want to hear it, I love to hear it, I'm kind of in part, I don't really care either way, I'm neutral. If we were all having these conversations, we'd all probably be having the hotter sex you're having, which really speaks to the fact that when, when we actually cultivate consent, it's not even about making consent sexy, it's that consent is mandatory, and when you discuss consent in such a nuanced and rich and beautiful way, the pleasure yes. is better, the connection is better, the sex is hotter, the orgasms flow more freely because you're relaxed, right? The body requires the rest and relaxed response in order to enjoy sexual response, so arousal and then the excitement, plateau and orgasm. When you go into fight or flight or a stress response, right, with those cortisol spikes, you're not gonna be able to enjoy sexual response and pleasure in your body. and simply by having these conversations, you're helping to assuage concerns, you're cultivating intimacy, you're developing trust, and you're laying the groundwork for hotter sex. And it's funny how, you know, when we get into it and you start sharing the questions, we think, well, of course we should ask these things. If you're coming to my house for dinner, I'm going to ask you if you have any food restrictions, any allergies, any preferences. If I'm spicing, hotting up your food, as we say here, uh, if I'm spicing up your food, I'm gonna wanna know, do you like it spicy? Do you like it mild? We ask these questions all the time. A strange on the takeout line asks me when I order online they want to know if I want my pad Thai mild medium spicy or Thai spicy uh, and they're exactly. asking my preferences and it follows that we ought to be doing the same when it comes to sex yes yep yeah agree to that <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk sex parties and group sex because those cultivations of consent are going to be different uh, let me just ask first and foremost like what was your first experience at a sex party like well, we've been to both private ones and ones where, like, it was more of a, a group and kind of a public thing where you could pay to get in. Um, so I feel like those are two very different things. Uh, the ones where it's it's just friends and everybody just knows each other already and things like that um, versus the uh, the event, like, more like an event thing. Which event are you referring to? I didn't go with you. <laughs> oh, okay. I okay. was somebody else. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I wasn't assuming that it was me, but that's... Okay, never mind. You don't have to explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> but um, overall, at the ones, and, and maybe it's just that I haven't been to a lot of them, but over the overall, the ones that were uh, events that were paid um, didn't really vibe with me very well. There was um, a lot of pressure at them mm. uh, from people that I wasn't interested in after I'd already said I wasn't interested. They just kind of kept following us around and became kind of uncomfortable. Um, we did meet a nice couple and you know do what we wanted to do and everything like that. But it, but we all but we all like left the premises together, you know. <laughs> um, 
and so there was something about the scene that you know y'all were able to connect but it wasn't a, a right the right space yeah it to didn't play. it didn't feel like a safe space basically okay and that's the case uh, most of the time when i go to anything around here in in my area of the woods it doesn't feel super i don't know Sex down south is different, but um, yeah. Yeah, no, I hear you. I think with with public parties, and I think that that pressure to which you refer is what keeps people away from those parties, even though they feel curious. And of course, pressure is the antithesis of pleasure. So I think if we're talking about consent, we have to talk about um, another dimension of it, and that's rejection. Uh, I believe that rejection and, and managing rejection is an essential life skill. It should be taught alongside communication and everything else to do with emotional literacy but it's not, yes. right? We don't know how to acknowledge rejection, lean into rejection, embrace, and then of course, work through rejection. So I'd love to talk about that because uh, you mentioned pressure and it's okay perhaps for somebody to say, hey, are you in the mood to chat? But if you've said no, or if you're at the gym and you're wearing your headphones and you clearly don't wanna to talk to anyone and somebody's pressuring you, uh, oftentimes it has to do with entitlement, but also their lack of capacity to deal with rejection. So. I'm curious, yeah. like, how you feel about rejection. Are you good at rejection? Any tips on rejection? Hmm. I think I'm terrible at it, <laughs> but I, I behave appropriately. I'm, I don't pressure the person anymore, but then I beat myself up for, like, ever, and I'm like, oh, I'm, like, so horrible. I'm such a pressuring person. I'm a, I'm a you know, I'm a villain, you know what I mean? It's like... You're a creeper. Yeah, I'm a creeper. Yeah. I'm a perv. Like, they hate, oh, well, yeah. I should never have sex again. <laughs> so I need to, like, oh, I need to calm down on that, you know what I mean? So, because um, I would I would honestly, like, even ask him to have sex more often, but I'm always afraid of being rejected. So, um, uh, I'm I don't with really you. have anything good to say. I'm with no, you I'm on that. At it. <laughs> okay. I'm with you on that in my um, in my long term relationship. I also um, struggle with rejection. So and it does hold me back sometimes from initiating. And I've had to like learn more recently to just push through that because if yeah. I leave sexual initiation with him all the time, a I might not get it as much as I want, and b right. it also puts all the onus of pressure on him to make right. sure we have sex and also to potentially deal with rejection because it doesn't mean I'm, I'm not always in the mood either. Um, but I, I, I think that, exactly. you know, when we look at someone else's situation, it can be easier, right? Um, to, to know that, for example, when someone says no to me, I don't need to personalize it, right? There are, a, a, there are hundreds yeah. of reasons why someone might say no to sex and it isn't about me as a person, me in terms of my character, me in terms of my worthiness. And that's why I think it's good to practice being rejected in kind of low pressure environments uh, so that when it comes to a higher pressure environment or something that feels higher stakes, like a relationship or like something sexual, we have better practice at it. And I think I took too long uh, to learn that. I was like later in life, I mean, I'm not that late in life, but later in life than I could have been <laughs> uh, when I learned that. I, I don't know if Jason, if you have a different perspective or experience. Uh, no, that's spot on. I, the majority yeah. of my young manhood was full of fear of rejection and, and having absolutely no good example from an older male or female for that matter that, that um, could explain any of this information like this that could help me get through that fear of rejection and participate uh, with other adults consensually. Um, no, there's there's all these expectations, especially from young men, or, or that's wrapped in our culture, where young men feel like they need to initiate the the yeah. engagement with a with a with a new person. You know, I'm I need to go approach the the girl or the guy. I need to go, um, you know, uh, you know start the sexual foreplay by with the touch or the look or lean in for the kiss for the yeah. first time. It's all very non-consensual. And when I learned about consent, it was just like, boom, that even feels sexy to me. This whole idea that we can sit, I can sit with somebody I've never had sex with and I'm, we're on the first date or the second date or whatever, whatever you're comfortable with and, and, and talk about sex and find out what they're comfortable with, what they're not comfortable with. Like that, that brings down the fear of rejection mm -hmm. so much. That's a good point. 
as opposed to, you know, just trying to do it, you know, and seeing if they respond positively or if they lean away or they slap you or whatever. <laughs> um, none of that felt right. The consent part felt right. And I didn't learn that until um, even just a few years ago. I mean, internally, I think I had some, some awareness that I was really wanting to talk about it with whomever. But um, that's but a lot of pressure. I and, I had, and I had no no uh, elders in my life who uh, could mentor me through that. So yeah, yeah that, that's a lot of pressure. Part of my young, my young man is, and even now as an adult, I feel like I'm still a little, a little hesitant, even when she's given me permission or we're uh, within our relationship to engage with people, say at a play party, and I still shy away from uh, being very forthcoming to someone for fear of like being a creeper or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, it's getting better. I yeah. definitely am feeling more confident. Um, I've had some positive feedback um, participating in the way that I think is, is right and consensual and they've responded positively and said, yes, I would like to, to play with you guys. And that's, that's been really impacting and, and helpful for me and my growth. So. So I'm curious, is being rejected helping with your management of rejection or attenuating your fear of rejection? Because when we think about anything that's rooted in like fear and anxiety, uh, we tend to avoid it, but that only reinforces the fear and anxiety. The more you experience that negative outcome that you fear so greatly, the less right. power it has over you. So like, for example, if you have a debilitating fear of, of being social, of going out, uh, you tend to avoid going out and it only reinforces your fear that something terrible is going to happen if you're around people. They're not going to like you. You're going to sweat to yeah. the point and you know, hyperventilate until you pass out. Um, you're going to be rejected. You're going to ma be made fun of. You're not going to be a part of the group. But if you slowly go out and do a few things and realize, hey, uh, <laughs> I wasn't fully rejected, or even if you do feel left out and you realize that life goes on, it chips away at that anxiety. So I, I really feel that it's the same when it comes to, to relationships and sex, right? If you go for it and somebody says, no, I'm, I'm not interested, or no, it's not a good time, or um, I don't think so, and you survive that, then I think you become more confident to try it again, as opposed to confidence being derived from everybody always saying yes to you. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. I think it's I think it's important to just keep keep trying. Obviously, don't necessarily push your way through everything, but keep attempting things in a very like ethical and honest way. And yeah, you will get rejected, but you've been you tried more things and if you just look at the numbers, probably you'll win some, you might lose some, <laughs> but you know. So, yeah, so recently I had some kind of, you know, major revelation where I had thought I wasn't afraid of death, but then realized I actually very much am. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that I, I might let that anxiety, since I'm not confronting it daily, I, it like creeps in and, it, and it, it pervades every aspect of my life and makes me kind of like slow myself down in every way. And when I started to be like, no, I'm actually scared of death. Like, let's just look at this in the face right now. And then you almost picture, you know, Grim Reaper or something. And like, that makes me turn around and like act. You know, I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna go live. I'm gonna go live right now. Cause like, that is kind of looming. And if I keep that, I know that sounds really weird. If I keep that in mind, it makes me have a little more courage to act. Um, but I'm one of those people who d holds himself back because of anxiety, you know, and so when I act, I know that I'm gonna be probably acting in a way that's still ethical and within consent boundaries. And it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm having such a hard time acting that then when I do, I'm like forceful with people. You know what I'm saying? So I just have to, I just need a little motivation sometimes. It's like, hey, you could die tomorrow. Like, don't panic too much about, you know, just make sure you're like stopping to smell the roses and stuff, you know, and, or, and asking for the things you want and getting pleasure out of your life because that's kind of the point, you know. For sure, and I like the way you both kind of share very vulnerably because I think people might look at you on screen and think that you know you have all all the confidence and you never have anxiety and you never question yourselves. But those are human experiences that we all share, and your willingness to speak about them I think is very very 
normalizing. And it also goes hand in hand with consent and cultivating consent and acknowledging that uh, there is no perfect way to do it. And we all are hesitant and we're all nervous and we all fear rejection. Uh, if we were to shift gears and think about folks who are, you know, in the early stages of dating, maybe they've never had sex with a new partner yet. Do you have any insights or advice on how to cultivate consent with somebody new? I've, I've thought about this a lot, given that I struggle with a lot of fear of rejection and um, getting the, um, you know, being brave enough to approach somebody. I, I have settled on, and what worked for me more recently is, again, like you were saying, I need to be vulnerable. I need, that's a great place for me to start. Let them know that I like them. Just, hey, I like yeah. you, I find you attractive. Tell, tell, don't go interrogating them first. Just let them know where you're coming from first. I'm approaching you because I think you're attractive. I'm approaching you because I like you or I like this or that. And um, would, you know, I, I don't know. I think just being, being vulnerable first instead of trying to be some stoic, um, you know, impenetrable force that's never, you know, that's got all, all your stuff together. Like nobody's got all their stuff together. So, uh, be vulnerable and, um, let them know what your intentions are. I think is a great you know, place. Jason, that sounds like the opposite of the messaging you were raised with, right? That like yes. the guys have to do it, you have <laughs> yes. to be good at it and you have to be smooth and you have to be suave. And if you lean in at the right angle and reach right. with your right hand, not your uh, left, and you uh, wink one eye, she'll kiss you back. Uh, as opposed yeah, to... there you go. <laughs> 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 as opposed to just saying like well this is awkward but i was thinking about i, I think hey. that's really beautiful thank you right. uh, anything from you Melissa? gosh i don't know i feel like um yeah like what he said maybe keep it really simple maybe not even i find you attractive or i like your and then name something maybe just i like you is easier that way you just make sure you're not some people might be like oh do you only like me for the way i look or you know, I guess my point is, like, I always just make it like really simple, like, hi, I like you. And I guess for, for me, I'm having a hard time, I'm um, fine, like when I want to work with people, it's always so tricky to be like, hi, I like you, and I would like to work with you, but I also just like you, so that would be cool if you didn't want to work, but you did want to hang out. But also, uh, I like your work, and I appreciate you as an artist, you know, so it's like, he's awkward. Right. But yeah, try to just keep it simple. But I think you can... Yeah, and you can give people options. Like, you know, I've been following your work and I really love it. I'm also attracted to you or I also like like your vibe. Wondering if you're open to like and their options, like working together, hanging sometime platonically or, or exploring things sexually, whatever it is you're into. Um, I do find that because I get those types of messages, maybe in a slightly different capacity. But with work, when somebody wants to collaborate with me, they'll say, well, we could do it in this way, A, B, C, D. And they kind of give me choice. And I actually love that as a way to cultivate consent. Uh, I also love, I'm going to put this out there. I, I, this is more in business, but I think it applies in the bedroom because anything that happens in the boardroom can also happen in the bedroom. Okay. I love when people also put it out there that I have the option to opt out, right? So yes. it's, it doesn't feel like pressure. Yeah. And I know that that onus isn't necessarily on them, but as a, I don't even think I can say recovering people pleaser, a people pleaser who's struggling, <laughs> um, when someone acknowledges that this may not be a fit, or I may not have the time for it, it makes me really want to consider working with them because I think that we're going to be a better fit in the way we communicate. God, you know, thanks I'm, for that. Thank you. That's yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm realizing that I kind of missed something that I am now realizing is, is even a step before approaching somebody. I need to know myself. I need to know what my own boundaries are. I need to know what I'm com like, what type of consent am I willing to give, um, at least some foundation of knowing myself. I, I don't. I don't believe too many people, especially young men, are going to go out and be very successful trying to figure out who they are with other people. I think people need to maybe just take a step back and honor themselves and get to know themselves, and then I think you'll be more successful reaching out to other people to interact with because you're more likely to know. Okay, well, this type of person may not be the best fit for me. Yes, I think they're visually attractive, but ultimately there's some other turnoffs that I'm not acknowledging yet or that I should be acknowledging because that doesn't really work with who I am. 
So does, does that make sense? I think consent can kind of start with oneself before you even maybe work with someone else. So maybe, maybe it's not two people. Maybe it's cons- maybe give maybe give yourself consent. You know, like have consent with yourself. I don't know. Right. Absolutely. Getting to know yourself, I think, is so important because if you are the initiator, it doesn't mean you're into everything. Right. And that's why also eradicating gender roles becomes so important, because if the pressure, for example, is on men to initiate with women, that doesn't mean that when she says yes, that he's going to be into everything that she's into. Like it's this ongoing conversation. And I think that you two are really living it because you've been together a while. You work together. You obviously have a really nice relationship and and it's seemingly what looks like a hot sex life. um, But you're still every single day cultivating consent with one another. And I think it's really beautiful. And it's probably what makes sex so hot so uh, i've been peppering you with questions is there anything you want to know from me i guess i could ask you i mean because i still do feel really shy about reaching out to people uh to initiate like i we want to have way more sex than we're having with others and i guess i would love any of your advice or tips or lines or uh i mean you've given a couple just like hey give options I don't know. I like that. Yeah, I need, how do I be braver? <laughs> you think I would be brave in this, but I'm not. <laughs> well, I think I imagine you're you're reaching out digitally, right? Via email or via like DM or something sure. like that. Yeah, most of it would be digital, right? But sometimes do, in person do you too. Ha- sometimes we're hanging out with people at a, at an event, you know, and I'm still like. Oh, well, that's way more scary. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Like, there's so many times that we pass stuff up, and we're both just like, she's so hot, or he's so hot, or they're so hot. <sighs> and I just, I don't, I don't ever like say the thing. Cause I'm always like, I don't want to be a predator. I don't want to be seen as pushy. Right, right. Like I, I don't ah, know. Like, we're going to get around that we're too aggressive and we just want to fuck everybody. Yeah. And it's like, no, I don't think we can say that word <laughs> right now. Oh. Anyway. Right, right. And you're, <laughs> you'll get away with it once. I'm sure. <laughs> I, I imagine that pressure is different for you because you're in the public eye, right? You live this, like the dual life of being, you know, Jason and Melissa, but you're also, you also have a brand and people may know who you are, right? And so you worry, you, I think you protect your rep- reputation in a different way, but I think you can be each other's buddies, right? Like I think, for example, so if you're sending the message, I would think that maybe, first of all, I love the idea of options. Um, okay. Secondly, and, and giving people the option to opt out because then it's going to be clear that you're not pushy. Uh, but also like doing a proofread where it's like, I wrote this email and then maybe you both have different communication styles. So you're able to kind of check each other and merge those two. I wonder, I wonder if that would help. And then also the lines that you're, (laughs) the lines that you're using on each other, like, would you guys maybe be into this or would you open, be open to, um, might be something that you'd use with like other singles and couples while you're out. But it sounds to me like you don't like the skills. It's just a fear of rejection. So my yeah. best, I don't even like the word advice, but for, for lack of a better word, is to go and get rejected. Like All when right. you get rejected, Thank you. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll be able to kind of sit with it and be like, hey, I'm not full of shame. I'm not worthless. I'm the exact same person with the exact same job and the exact same people who love me. I always think about that in everything I do. Like I think about the love I'm surrounded by, um, like the roof I have over my head, which I, you know, we're very lucky to have, uh, and my health. And somebody not wanting me is not going to affect any of those things, right? Uh, right. And that's that's why I admitted, like, I think I feel a little like the stakes are higher with my long-term love of my life partner with whom I've been with forever. But again, if he doesn't want to have sex with me, he's not leaving me. He's just tired. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or it's a bad time. Or, or, yeah. or I didn't try hard enough because I'm terrible. Yes. But uh, I think that you have to get out there and, and get rejected. And then the last thing I'll say and this is for everybody, uh, if you're interested in something, let people know. Like if you're looking to date, if you're looking to hook up, tell your circle because your circle will get it out there for you. I've, I've right. been yeah, at events right. where, uh, it, yeah, like I've been at events where it's mostly couples and there'll be one or two singles. And I had a guy many years ago stand up and say, I'm recently, and he knew these people, they were business associates. I'm recently divorced, I'm ready to date again. This is what I bring to the table. This is what I'm looking for. If any of you know anyone, let me know. And he got all these different, uh, you know, personal matchmaker introductions. So just also let people know and know that you're not creepy. Sex is not inherently creepy. Wanting sex is not inherently creepy. And I think that's why we need to have a strong delineation 
between cultivating consent and putting on pressure. And you two obviously know the difference in, in, in between those two things. And hopefully folks, uh, hopefully you too have, you know, picked up some of uh, the sexy hippies pearls of wisdom and learned something here too. So, and we're gonna just, I guess we're all gonna go out there and cultivate more consent. And if you yeah. wanna make it sexy, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it was great chatting with you both. It was Same great chatting with you. With you. Thank great. you so much. Thank you. So many great insights and thank you for being here. Hopefully you've learned something about consent and most importantly, hopefully you'll keep the conversation going. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and put them down below.